First night of class, teaching as an adjunct, one night a week, Monday nights, at Elmhurst University. And it reminds me, when classes start like this, of one of the funniest things that happened to me when I was an adjunct, and that is, after about a 45 minutes or an hour into the very first class, a couple people sitting right in the front row looked at me and said, excuse me, what class is this? I said, well, gave them the name of the class. We've been through the syllabus, been through the whole thing. And they said, hmm. I think, I think I'm in the wrong class. And the kid next to them said, me too. And the third kid said, me three. And that, that's what life is like in higher education today. Hi, I'm James Callahan, and this is The Do-Over Show. And with 20 plus years of teaching in higher education, I've got stories to tell. So here's the way it goes. When things don't work out for people in higher education, they're rarely fired, unless you receive that permanent promise of tenure. Just about everybody else is on an annual contract or a semester contract. And most of those contracts, like the ones I get from Elmhurst University, where I've taught as an adjunct for 20 years, arrive the week before classes start, well after you've chosen your textbook, read it, prepped for your new presentation, new courses. You don't get the final confirmation until a couple days before the first class. And that's the way it is. So what happens to you if you don't get fired? Well, you're just not asked back. There is no permanent status. There is no expectation that you will be asked back, which is why when it happens, most of us should just say, thank you. And when it doesn't work out for us, most of us should just say, hey, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Why thank you when things don't work out? Because complaining and being angry about not getting our way, not getting what we think we deserve in higher education, never got one of us a job, and it never helped any of us keep a job, being angry and complaining. In fact, one of the number one things that's added today to try to curtail tenure, the permanent faculty appointments, in post-tenure review are little things written in by the administration and the trustees to tenured faculty saying that they will be reviewed annually and they're prohibited from saying anything negative or derogatory or demeaning about the school, the college, the university, other faculty, the administrators, or the trustees. And if they do, they'll lose even the permanency of tenure through post-tenure review. Now, sometimes there are really good reasons why someone is not asked back or not retained as a teacher in higher education. And the number one reason is that they suck at teaching. Yep. It is so obvious that the great majority, as in almost all of us in higher education, have never actually learned how to teach. We are experts in our field. We talk in our sleep with our quotients and our quotes and our footnotes and our endnotes, and we know tremendous detail. But when it comes to actually learning how to communicate with a group of young adults, or second career students, or the mixed variety of students we get in today's classrooms, depending on where you're teaching, what program you're in, most of us have never actually spent time or been taught how to teach. Look, I've done a video, and you can check it out here, about new ways to get us back into this engagement with teaching and learning how to actually become teachers, because the number one reason why you might not be asked back is that, well, you're not a good teacher. Now, sometimes it's because we cause trouble. And we think of ourselves as the sort of radical class, and we're going to speak the truth to power. And the truth we speak to power to the administration is the reason why we're not asked back. Why? Because when we splash and make waves, the administration doesn't like getting splashed or getting wet. And they're going to use one reason, and one reason primarily, to tell the world, to tell themselves, to tell other faculty why it didn't work out. And they're going to simply say that you were not a fit and they're gonna use air quotes like the academic deans and provosts have used with many of my friends and me. You're not a fit for the college or university. Let me tell you a story about one of those times when I wasn't a fit. It was just three days after the birth of one of my kids. Now, thankfully, my wife took care of that part of it and I showed up on a bitterly cold January morning in between semesters where I was a full-time visiting faculty member at a small private college. For a meeting with the provost 
And on that morning, me all dressed up, suit, tie, looking very professional, trying to make a good impression, and I had no clue why I was called into the meeting. The provost began by saying, oh, I heard you had a new baby. Congratulations, how's the baby? What's the child's name? Oh, how mom, all of that. Yes, very polite, very nice. And then said, I bet you're wondering why I asked for this meeting. We said he began reviewing budgets and majors and faculty lines for the upcoming year. And my contract was going to extend through the spring semester, no worries there. But in the upcoming year, well, things were going to be a little different, a little tight, and they weren't going to have room at this college for me to renew a contract for an additional year. Why I thought that I must have done something wrong was not because I knew I had done something wrong. I really didn't have a clue. And when I pressed the provost, I said, could you give me something concrete, something that I can learn from? you know, about why I wasn't a fit. He said, you know, it's just a matter of an academic feeling. An academic feeling? Yes, an academic feeling. I'm just not feeling it that you're a fit for the college. There was nothing I could do about it. There was nothing I could do to change it. There was nothing that would happen in the spring semester, even if I was the best of all teachers. And by the way, in the spring semester by my colleagues, I was recommended for an award, Junior Faculty of the Year. Needless to say, because the provost was on that committee, I didn't get the award for junior faculty of that year. A friend of mine did. They deserved it. It was great, but it kind of felt good to get the nomination. Now, sometimes you're not a good fit at a college or university, and there's a good reason. There's a reason of moral outrage that you, should, you say to yourself, I really don't want to teach at a place like this. All things being equal, even though I could survive with a little bit more money, it happened to me one semester when I was teaching at two different schools. At the one school, in order to advance my prospects at the school, I took a certification program that they offered on campus with an outside agency to become a mandatory reporter in the state of Illinois. So that if I observed anything looking like abuse in an, an adult or young adult of a college student, that it was my responsibility, I had to report it to the proper authorities. Now, when I did that at one school, and then I went to a second school to teach. It was a Catholic university nearby. And if you know anything about the history, not just of, of the problem with the priest scandal and pedophilia, but if you know anything about the history of Catholic education, you realize that mandatory reporters are, well, they're not part of Catholic education generally. And when the department chair halfway through that semester found out because I added the certification to my resume, my CV, and I turned in my updated CV because I was hoping to get more courses at the Catholic University in the next year, the department chair noted it, called me into his office and said, so I see you've had some additions to your CV, yes, and among them that you're now a certified mandatory reporter, yes. And I didn't get asked back in the next year. I'd done a good job teaching at the Catholic University. I taught a couple sections, made some good money, but I was not asked back because I had done something that disqualified me on moral grounds from actually teaching as an adjunct for that university. Now, sometimes when we do things that, yeah, they cause splashes, well, we put ourselves on the spot because we think we're doing the right thing because we're being transparent, we're adding to the community like a colleague of mine, a friend at a small school that wrote a letter to the editor of the student newspaper. And of course, when a faculty member writes a letter, they want to publish it. And he pu they published the letter. And it made everyone rather upset that this faculty member sort of came clean about something that was going on in the community and that the university that college actually was connected to. When everybody saw it, he got a lot of attention, a lot of praise. Students loved it faculty, colleagues patted him on the back, and he was never seen again. After that semester, that is, after he turned in his grades, cashed his last paycheck, and he's never been asked back. And that is that sometimes in higher education, we create for ourselves a reputation, and the reputation can precede us, not just follow us. And that is, we can be known as someone who is just too much trouble to take on. And one of the key roles about get, finding a place in higher education today is that you have to go in and the dean, the department chair, has to think that you're the answer to their problem, not going to cause more problems for them. They're not going to hire people who they know bring with them the baggage of causing problems. Unless you're a superstar and unless you're a celebrity adjunct and unless you are an influencer on social media, 
and on YouTube you're not going to be invited to teach under those conditions. And that reminds me of the time where I jumped in to bail out a grad school in a professional program when one of the regular faculty two or three weeks into the semester went completely off the rails, had open fights with everybody, the administrators, the deans, called up some of the trustees, yelled at a bunch of students, just completely lost it. I was teaching one course at the school. I had a job that I had flexible hours and it was teaching one morning. And the week after this thing had unfolded, the dean came by my class and said, hey, can I talk to you? Pulled me into his office and said, we are in trouble. You've heard about what happened? Yeah, I heard about what happened. Well, we have to, we have to suspend his role of teaching. He's not gonna be able to finish the semester, but we've got two courses going and three scheduled for the next semester where this person was supposed to teach. Is there any chance you could take one or all of those courses? Now, as I said, I had a very non-traditional job at the time and I could move around and they were actually happy that I was able to teach at this local grad school in this professional program. So I checked it out and I came back to the dean and I said, yes. Now, that one course I was teaching, I was getting $3,500 for teaching. And that was a while ago, so that was really good money. The full-time professor that they had to let go in the middle of the well, start of the semester was making over $70,000 a year, it turns out, because one of my colleagues told me what he was making. Now, I was teaching one course at $3,500, so I was going to add two more, both at $3,500, and the next semester three at $3,500, so I was going to make a little over $20,000. But the school was going to save about $50,000 for all of their trouble. So my colleague, who had actually gotten me a job at the school, we'd worked together at another school, and he said, hey, you should come and teach, and he got me in. And when I stepped in to teach these courses, he said, I'm gonna buy you lunch because you really bailed out the program. And he asked me, well, what did you work out with the dean? And I said, I'm gonna teach the courses. How much? 3,500 each. He goes, oh, no, 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 you need to ask for more. The, this guy who, who left, he was making almost 70000 or more. You should really get more. You should go to the dean and ask for more. So I contacted the dean. The dean said, hmm, very interesting. I'll get back to you. He never did. I said, I went back to him and I said, hey, just before the start of that next semester where I was going to make, yeah, you know, like a little over ten grand for teaching those three courses, I said, is there any way that you can give me more? I didn't even give him a number. Maybe that was my fault in negotiating. But I didn't say to him, no, I'm not gonna do it. I said, I really wanna do it, but you know, it really seems fair that you give me more. Seems fair is not a negotiating tactic when it comes to your salary in higher education. I taught the courses for 3,500 a piece and that was my one shot at full-time status with that grad school. I didn't get another course the next year because they filled the job with a new hire and I'm sure they paid that person really well. It, it, it's the time that when it does happen, when there is negotiation, you have to figure this, when you're not a tenured person, even when you're working on tenure, there really isn't negotiation that happens. That is the pay scales and the brackets are set. And I hope you're hearing in these stories some of what the reality is today. And to be transparent, about 70% of the courses that are taught in higher education in the United States today are taught by non-traditional faculty, non-tenured track, non-tenured faculty. And almost 60% of the faculty at all of our colleges and universities are this non-traditional category adjuncts, temps, seasonal, annual contracts, visiting, whatever. This is the norm. And when you hear these stories, and you've probably got a few yourself, make sure you start dropping them in the comments below. But when you hear these stories, I hope you're finding ways to figure out where you fit in higher education. And if you're trying to negotiate your way to navigate these uncertain and loud and difficult times in higher education, when everything is changing but nothing is really benefiting those who are non-traditional faculty who really do most of the work but are on the margins of compensation and recognition in higher education today, I hope in my stories you're finding something that helps you ground the work that you were doing, give you good reasons to do it, do it for the right reasons, the things that you choose to do them for that no one can take away from you and no amount of money, no amount of money will ever make meaningless. 
And thanks for being part of the Do Over Show. Please, could you tap the like button? Because it really helps. And while you're down there, how about you subscribe and ring the notification bell so you don't miss the next episode and the next series of stories about surviving higher education today. I'm so glad you found me and I found you. Thanks.